Hey everyone and welcome back to the World of Warcraft news. Today there is an absolute shed load of stuff, so okay, let's get straight into the news. And first we've got to talk about that tweet. Because this was spread across the web, uh, claiming that World of Warcraft has in fact been surpassed by Final Fantasy XIV. Now that's a pretty big claim. I mean, we know FF is doing well, but wow, it's pretty bloody big, isn't it? Okay, so the sourcing of the article that led to the tweet that spread everywhere is MMOPopulation.com. What is that? Well, the thing here is most MMOs don't actually like show their, their populations publicly. So what this site does is it uses a blend of publicly available engagement metrics to estimate population. Now, a very simple way to do that is using like Google Trends, FF14, World of Warcraft. You can see FF's doing real good, but I assume they use a little bit more data there. And you may be wondering, what does this mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means that those numbers reporting the super high players, it means that those are estimates and that they are based on a mixture of sentiment analysis and engagement tracking like publicly available sources, right? Any public sources. So if something is public, it will be weighted decently heavily, I would imagine. So that's the first thing. Players of either game whose gameplay doesn't leave, uh, leave a digital footprint, well, they're not going to be counted. So that's quite a lot of people, I imagine. The next up there is seasonality. FF14 is coming off the high of its best expansion ever and a passion-packed fan fest while at the same time World of Warcraft is, of course, recovering from an expansion that's struggled to go the distance, let's say, and a development cycle that is struggling to keep pace. So, yeah, if your estimate is based off public MMO data, without you doing specific work on a per-MMO basis, say, scraping the Armory API, um, and you would have to not do specific per-MMO work because of the amount of MMOs covered here, then yeah, obviously, based on the public data, WoW would look weaker right now, and FF14 would look stronger. Not a surprise. I think Google Trends says similar. So that's the data. Pretty simple, I think. And, and look, I think FF14 has a limited overlap with the WoW audience due to, say, aesthetic reasons, or perhaps if you're a Mythic Plus key pusher, or somebody who wants to raid at the highest levels, well, like, FF just doesn't have as much raid content as WoW does. So, a lot of WoW people, FF's not going to cater to them. I will say I'm loving the game for what it is, with its narrative, some of the glam stuff, some of the raid and class design stuff, all of that. I'm not going to go through all of it, I'd be gushing for too long, TLDR, I am kind of hooked. But also, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you should take this site super seriously. Basically, nobody does. Take this whole story as an echo of the obvious that World of Warcraft is having a tougher time than usual right now, and that Final Fantasy XIV is basically on a big high, and that FF is successfully capitalizing on that high by targeting the WoW audience, such as paid, you know, sponsored streams, uh, I, th I think Annie Fushia did one, and, uh, you know, like the 60% off deal, as an example. But to what degree FF is doing well, the numbers, you literally cannot know. And also, by the way, this counts WoW Classic separately, so combined, yeah, Classic and Modern would come out on top. So, there's that. Honestly, th there's not much to it, but made waves, so should acknowledge it. Loads of cinematics have been data mined, and really, they're like little interconnect of cinematics and cutscenes between bits of the story that themselves don't contain super significant lore, so even though there's quite a lot there, I'm not going to go through them today because honestly, it would just spoil your gameplay. Now that said, there is one that had the initial appearance in the data mining that sort of made it look like Anduin had died or something. That led to uh, just uh, you know, spreading around a little bit that Anduin was dead. Um, all I can say is this, Anduin does not die in that cinematic anyway. Who knows? He could get killed in the raid. I, I can't tell you, but not in that cinematic. So just in case people have shared You've maybe seen that Anduin has died, and the stories went to shit and all that. No, that's not happening. Um, basically, this cinematic is with known characters watching a vision, and this vision has got Sylvanas and Anduin, so it's likely a vision of past events. Now, the actual like file name of this, or one of the data mine strings, was Goodbye Anduin. Now, people thought that meant he could be dead. But that could literally, and actually, if you look at the cinematic, 
could literally just be Anduin saying goodbye to Sylvanas, or the opposite. I mean, who knows? Perhaps they had an actual chat before the Jailer used his domination magic stuff. Hard to say. Um, I think it's because you know, the father's um, compass is involved too. But either way here, I imagine something happens to Anduin in the raid, and that in this cinematic, we are either reminiscing on what happened to Anduin, or perhaps digging through the past for clues, something like that. But this is not a thing of him dying. And also, it's extremely, extremely early and work in progress. Just like our Patreon relaunch project! Okay, it's not that early, because if you want to hear our lore walking podcast episodes on The Light and yogg the Light one has got big expansion hype, by the way, I uh, had a blast doing that one, um, or going beyond lore, if you want to listen to the General Chat podcast or the Losing Our Marbles podcast, then uh, yeah, Patreon, that's where to go, because we run three podcasts over there. Uh, we'll, oh, also, Mace, this month. Um, we will announce that formally enough, but, uh, yeah, for now, Patreon, thank you for all your support, bunch of new people over the last while, and, uh, we're doing podcasts now. All right, back to the news. So, you know Shards of Domination, right? They are the new gems that you can put into the special gear that contains Domination sockets. That gear comes from the raid, and actually, it seems like you could be able to purchase a little bit of outside of the raid, but that's a little bit iffy in PTR right now. Well... It used to be the Domination Shards were destroyed whenever you socket a new one in. It would operate just like gems. Now the thing is, these Domination Shards are basically gems, and the actual gems themselves are things that you can upgrade using a new raid currency. And you couldn't upgrade a socketed shard. So the whole thing was basically a big mess um, on the last PTR build. With the current PTR build, they have added in the Soul Fire Chisel. This is an item that lets you remove a domination shard from a socket without destroying the shard. Phew. <laughs> Phew. Because it had seemed like they were about to do a friggin, you know, consumable conduits thing there. Um, so that's really good. But there is an iffy bit. Right, so domination sockets then. Um, and if you look at the new raid gear, they're appearing on chest, helm, and shoulders. Just kind of funny, because that's the same as the Azerite gear slots. Um, but the point is, they can be on those slots. So do you spot the problem here? Because what if you've already crafted legendaries in slots that are used by domination gear? Well, the most recent PTR has added extra slots to the legendary effects. Right? So a bit more flexibility when you're crafting legendaries. You can put the same effect on more slots now. But, well, okay, and that is because, say, if you have domination sockets on your shoulders, that would mean that you could move the Legos uh, off your shoulders onto another slot so you could get both. But the problem right now, this is the bit that will suck, uh, you'd actually need to recraft your legendary. I mean, for my example, my legendary is on my shoulder piece, because that's what made sense for male wearers in Castle Nathria. Now, I expected to continue investing currency into my shoulders to upgrade their item level in the new patch. But that actually won't happen, because it seems like what I'll want to do is get a shoulder piece with a domination socket, and then that might mean that I'll maybe want to recraft the same legendary effect that I already have on my shoulders on another slot for my character, and then upgrade that from scratch. And that would mean that all the soul ash that I invested in the, the Lego, right, that, that essentially would be wasted. Because there is no way to, you know, disenchant or something like that, a legendary to get a soul ash refund. So they have this weird thing where, well, look, it kind of does throw, it feels like it throws some of your past efforts into the bin. Because that Lego that you, you, you know, you, you did might not be fit for purpose anymore because of the way that the domination socket slots work. And that's the thing. Blizzard launched legendaries in 9.0. And in 9.1, they're adding a system that kind of competes with players' 9.0 legendary progress. I mean, much more so as well, because like the Legos, they are our highest item level bits of gear. So because of that, players put, uh, you know, legendaries on the highest stat slots, such as the helm, shoulders, and chest, which of course is, um, you know, <laughs> there's, there's shards of domination slots on those, uh, or sockets on those slots. So basically, it doesn't really feel planned, because the 9.1 thing is kind of fighting with the 9.0 thing. Now look, I will cut them some slack, 
All you really need to do to fix up this system is give us a way to destroy our current legendaries in return for a resource refund. And I think that would be fair. The reason why is that Blizzard changed the setup of the game, right? So if 9.1 makes it feel like your 9.0 work was a total waste, and that all that soul ash is basically gone and deleted, well then you have a situation where 9.1 would make people feel bad about the time that they spent in 9.0. And that would mean that people would feel less willing to put time into 9.1 because they'd be worried the 9.2 would invalidate their work. And this is an issue WoW has had, right? Where, you know, it's it's very often the, the wise thing to do is, is basically just to, you know, wait a few patches because the expansion will probably resemble being done by the 0.2 or the 0.3 patch of an expansion because how they do things these days. Now, there are some additional concerns here. I mean, as an example, the Domination Socket... Uh, set bonuses, those are only active in Raid, the Maw, and Torghast. But the effects on the actual gems themselves, the shards, which are significant, they work everywhere, including PvP. Now, that's got some PvPers worried that they're going to need to engage in the domination gear system for PvP, because apparently those gem effects really are quite strong. Not ideal there, because this is the progression system intended for raiders, and to be honest with you, as a raider, I would be more than happy if my domination shards and set bonuses only worked in the raid, because, frankly, I mean, the, the theming of that would make sense, and, uh, you know, I don't want the things for my bit of content to get in the way of things that other people enjoy and mess up their gameplay, so I'd be happy enough with that. But yeah, let me know. I'd, I'd hope that some of the Domination Shard stuff, honestly, would be a bit more simple than it's, uh, than it's turning out, but uh, hey, we'll just have to see how it goes. Next, then, the Recolor Drama. So I wanted to touch on this. Uh, so while shown at BlizzCon, the Season 2 Mythic Plus Keystone Master mount has now finally been added to the public test realm. And it's a slightly different hue. And I'm just going to go here and say this is nowhere near good enough. Uh, now, none of us are unfamiliar to mounts getting all manner of recolors for different types or levels of content, like, as an example, the seasonal PvP gladiator mounts, right? But just because that's something that is done does not excuse or justify Blizzard pretty much sliding the hue bar slightly on the mount color here. If you look at it, the metal harness, not drastically changing color, is something that I get, but the anima color, I mean, come on, right? Come on. You've already got really cool looking anima-like assets for the various different covenant anima colors and effects, but what they've went for is just a very slightly different hue of last season's mount. I mean, at least with previous expansion seasonal PvP gladiator mounts, like... Yeah, they would share the same base model, but the whole mount would get a recolor. And while not massive here, I would say that considering that Mythic Plus players really do rarely get much content in a new patch, right? Just more scaling in existing dungeons most of the time, and of course the seasonal affix, I think they deserve better here. Because look, the Gladiator mount is so niche that, yeah, it's not much of a problem. It is so niche. But the thing is that in PvP, they get each season a Vicious Mount, and those Vicious Mounts look incredible. So if the PvPers are getting a really cool Vicious Mount each season, why is it that the Mythic Plus players get an extremely shitty, lazy recolor? And I'm just going to say that it is that, because it is that. I don't know. It should be better. Do better, Blizzard. You're not a cash-strapped indie company. Tazavesh stuff. Okay, it was found the Tazavesh gear is no longer upgradable with Valor, which was a surprise to people because it had been upgradable with Valor for ages on the PTR. So now, instead of being upgradable with a base item level of 210, it now drops at 226 and can not be upgraded. And this has been hotly debated, and honestly, it's a debate that, it's a debate that felt pretty stupid to me. So first, it is nice that this gear drops at a higher baseline item level, because 226 is certainly a larger number than 210. Uh, but it's not bigger than 246, which is what previously you could technically eventually upgrade that gear to with Valor points. But we also have to remember that it's not recommended that really anybody upgrades Mythic Plus gear with Valor points from the lowest baseline item level up to the highest, because Valor is a seasonally capped currency, so that would be a massive, massive waste of Valor. 
But also, it doesn't have to be this way. This is the thing that I want to say. Hey, everyone, we can be creative. We can think about how things could be instead of just lazily referring to the past and being a big old stick in the mud. No, we could actually use our goddamn brains. So this is how, this whole thing is how Blizzard intentionally designed the system. Valor is by no means comparable to Conquest, remember. Conquest is only used to purchase PvP gear, not to upgrade it. That is handled by the uncapped currency of honor. So it shouldn't be the complete wrong decision for a more casual player to slowly but gradually upgrade all their gear from Mythic Plus as they progress up the Keystone Ladder. Right now, you are punished for doing that because of how Blizzard designed the system, but I don't think it should be that way. I think a casual player slowly pushing should feel just fine putting a few little upgrades into their gear. The only penalty should be that it should take longer for people to do it the casual way than for the people who can go and complete high-level keys quicker you know, perhaps have justice points as an uncapped currency for upgrading your Mythic Plus gear up to a certain level, right? Maybe heroic raid level, something like that. And then, I don't know, maybe uh, use the capped currency of Valor to upgrade gear past a higher, you know, item level threshold. You could do something like that by splitting the two currencies, and uh, that would mean the casual players would be happy up to a point where it's reasonable, and then for your big upgrades, you need Valor. Simple, it would work. And then secondly, I want to tackle a bit of a dumb thing. While it is most definitely true that previous Mega Dungeons in World of Warcraft did not have upgradable gear, that's a stupid point to make because gear from Mythic Plus was not upgradable. The Valor Point system did not exist at that point in time. So that is a very silly argument to make because the context of that gear is different. And also, uh, Mythic Plus Zero gear? is currently upgradable in the system right now. So it kind of would follow that Tazavesh, which is Mythic Zero, would still be upgradable. Just saying. Just because the system worked in a specific way in the past does not mean that we should be constrained by that in, the, in future iterations. I am going to suggest a crazy thing called creative thinking. It surely is in both Blizzard and the player's best interests to keep this stuff exciting, cool, and fun. And to have the exciting, cool, and fun new Mega Dungeon be relevant for longer in the patch cycle so that people can enjoy that great content, rather than it being a one-off thing that you do before clearing normal Sanctum of Domination or, you know, just a farm run for a few of the new mounts. So there you go. Finally, if your issue with the previous item level potential of Tazavesh gear was that it was too high, up to 246 item level, then I need only point you to the new mod touched gear that will actually go up to item level 233 by doing just world content. Albeit it will take quite a while to do that because it's rep and currency, uh, you know, in involved in it. And for the Tazavesh stuff, it's not like it would have been free item level 246 gear either because you would have needed I mean, the required Valor points, and also the required Mythic Plus rating to upgrade it to that max item level. And that is something that takes quite a bit of effort, especially with, um, you know, how much Fortified Plus Tyrannical uh, keys are going to be, um, you know, impacting your Mythic Plus rating. In my mind, Tazavesh, on arrival, is pretty much just for a bunch of people an alt gearing instance with two new flying disc mounts that aren't exactly the most exciting or interesting, right? So I'd say there, maybe add in a rideable version of the infinite dragon pirate mount, do some things there, and maybe a little bit of work in the gear because there could actually be a bit of hope. And the reason why is that while Blizzard haven't actually added any hard mode triggers or mechanics on the public test realm yet, there are some text strings that have been data mined, and those include a new quest that mentions hard mode, though it still looks to be work in progress. So that's something. Now, the bosses mentioned here in this quest are the ones present in the first half of the Tazavesh Mega Dungeon. Now, that is a setup that's fairly similar to Mechagon, of course, where you needed to defeat the first three bosses of the outside area on hard mode in order to actually be able to enable the hard mode for the fourth and final boss of that wing. So that's how it could work. 
So hopefully we get to see and test these um, hard mode things decently soon anyway. Though to be honest, I'm surprised that that stuff hasn't been tested or on PTR yet because um, time? Time is really ticking. I mean, hey, maybe if the hard mode gear just had that upgradable flag ticked on it, then maybe that would be great. Maybe that's worth looking into. Uh, I don't know. Point is, we've made this big, awesome mega dungeon. How about we get a little bit more out of it? Next, Blizzard have announced that starting June 8th, all friends in Europe, Americas, and Asia are going to be merged into a single global friends list. So while, of course, you're still unable to actually play with players who are from different regions, at least on World of Warcraft, this certainly is a step towards, um, well, it feels like a step towards that dream. I mean, it's probably not, but hey, your friends list is more global now. Uh, now, there is one thing of note, and that is that they've not currently announced or implemented an increase in the friend list size. So that does mean if your friend list is um, close to full or full right now, well, tough luck. If you want to get some global friends, you'll need to do a spring clean. So there you go, that is it for the Warcraft news. Hopefully we did not get too many people salty and irate over our Tazavesh gear upgrade segment. I'm sure that will be a very fun one. But other than that, that is it for the news. So thank you for uh, thank you for watching. Of course, you can check out the Clips channel for some clip stuff uh, on this channel, unlisted in a playlist on the front page of the channel. So it's an unlisted video, public playlist. Um, that's where yesterday's big live show uh, lives. So you can always get those from the front page of the channel. And of course, if you want oh, five plus hours of podcast content right now, it's going to be more soon, uh, head up the Patreon. We're doing weekly podcasts. Okay, that's it for me. Have a wonderful day and I will see you next time. Bye.